So on Tuesday, the last set of states casted their votes in California and New Jersey and Montana, as well as other states. And of course, before anyone voted, the Associated Press already declared Hillary Clinton the winner. Uh, typical, because the moment that Hillary Clinton actually announced that she was running for president, she was already anointed the winner, not just of the Democratic nomination, but of the presidency, so this isn't surprising, but it was a really bad day for progressives overall. So one, Bernie Sanders lost in California and New Jersey by double digits, although there are still 3 million ballots to be counted in California. Uh, and furthermore, Alex Law, who was running against Donald Norcross, an establishment shill in New Jersey, lost by double digits as well. So this was a really difficult day if you're a progressive, if you actually wanted political change. So as of now, here's where the primary race stands. Hillary Clinton has 2,203 pledge delegates and Bernie Sanders has 1,828 pledge delegates. So neither has secured the 2,383 to clinch the Democratic nomination. So this will come down to the superdelegates who will ultimately decide who's officially the winner at the convention in Philadelphia in July. Now, it is the case that since Hillary Clinton has more pledged delegates, she will most likely be the nominee. So that's why she's being called the presumptive nominee. But it is the case that it's not official yet. Now, it's almost guaranteed that the superdelegates will vote for Hillary Clinton, 99.9% .9 chance. They're most likely not going to flip for Bernie Sanders. Uh, if you question that, then you have to think about who's voting. It's former presidents, it's governors, it's members of the Senate, of, how, of the House. These are corrupt Democratic establishment officials, so they're obviously not going to support someone like Bernie Sanders. Uh, now, the only way that they would most likely switch is if FBI Director James Comey actually recommends an indictment prior to the convention, but we have no idea when that's going to happen. So at this point, it looks as though Bernie Sanders has lost, unfortunately. So what are the implications of this? Well, contrary to popular belief, I do not believe that Bernie Sanders should drop out under any circumstances. No, because the minute he drops out, he loses all all leverage he has against the Democratic Party. If he drops out and endorses Hillary Clinton, they can tell him to take a hike. But if he remains in the race until the convention, then he actually has some influence over the Democratic platform. He may have some influence over Hillary Clinton's policies, over who may be her VP pick and whatnot. And, you know, that still won't encourage me to vote for Hillary Clinton, but it's better than nothing. He has to hang on to that leverage he has. Otherwise, the Democratic Party will not be representative of progressives. Now, media outlets have been consistently calling for Bernie Sanders to drop out. Democratic establishment officials have been calling for Bernie Sanders to drop out. Everyone's acting as though Hillary Clinton is officially the nominee. So President Obama endorsed her and Elizabeth Warren officially endorsed her today, which is a little bit embarrassing because it kind of goes against everything that President Obama and, El and Elizabeth Warren stand for. Because let me remind you, in 2012, they were both railing against Mitt Romney for taking a lot of money from special interests, for giving private speeches to special interests, and now they're endorsing the Democratic version of Mitt Romney. So congratulations to both of you for selling out. Uh, honestly embarrassing, but as we've seen through and through, so many people within the media in the Democratic establishment have shown their true colors, so I'm honestly not surprised at all. Now, needless to say, with all of this happening, it's been a really difficult week for progressives, but I don't want you guys to be upset. I want you guys to hold your head high, because what we accomplished was nothing short of unprecedented. So let me remind you that when Bernie Sanders entered the race, he was polling at 3.6% whereas Hillary Clinton was polling at 61.7%. Bernie Sanders closed that gap entirely. Now, this is in spite of the fact that nobody knew who Bernie Sanders was and everyone knew who Hillary Clinton was. Uh, it's in spite of the fact that the corrupt corporate media establishment refused to cover Bernie Sanders. It's in spite of the fact that he didn't take money from special interests and did not have a super PAC. And finally, this is in spite of the fact that the Democratic establishment has tipped the scales in favor of Hillary Clinton from the beginning, everything from the Van scandal to collaborating with the Clinton campaign to limit the amount of debates there were to election fraud that was just rampant in uh, Arizona, in New York, in California. So in spite of all of this, Bernie Sanders nearly captured the nomination from a political machine that is Hillary Clinton. That's impressive. That's not Bernie Sanders. That's you guys. Now, what Bernie Sanders did was he proved that the Democratic Party, they hate progressives. They don't like us. They showed their true colors. So people who we thought were progressives, like Barbara Boxer and Bill de Blasio, 
turned out to be spineless Democrats. Look, there's three types of Democrats. There's the corrupt corporatist Democrats. There are the spineless Democrats who are afraid to stand up to the previous Democrats that I mentioned. And then there's the third option, which is just the combination of both. And anyone who was progressive, well, they're not really progressive. They're just spineless. So they're willing to speak out and be progressive if the democratic establishment loosens their leash enough for them to do it. And they also show their true colors by alleging that anyone who doesn't support Hillary Clinton because of policy reasons is sexist. Hillary Clinton implied that Bernie Sanders was sexist, was racist. Bill Clinton implied that we are like the Tea Party and that we're sexist and he called us Bernie bros. And he said that we're only angry because we know that our candidate is toast. And Hillary Clinton said that young people need to do their research, and it's really sad that we don't do our research, and that's why we believe Bernie Sanders lies about her. And my favorite part about this is that instead of trying to court us over, Hillary Clinton gave us the middle finger and started to court over Bush donors instead. <laughs> this is reality, people. This is American politics in 2016. Now, after all of these shenanigans, Bernie Sanders supporters are now being yelled at by Hillary Clinton supporters, by Hillary Clinton, by the Democratic establishment, and we're being told to fall in line because Donald Trump is so scary. Here's a crazy concept, maybe just for once, I actually want to vote for someone who I legitimately like, who I actually agree with, not just because I think that this person is less shitty than the other person. I mean, this is a democracy, right? Why is that such a crazy idea? So after the smears, after the election fraud in Arizona, in New York, in Puerto Rico, after the media bias, and after the weight of the establishment coming down on Bernie Sanders and his supporters, do you want to know what my response is when they tell me to fall in line? Fuck no. I refuse to fall in line. I will not acquiesce. I will not tow the party line. Sorry. In fact, the Democratic Party has done nothing but try to disenfranchise me. They've stuck their middle finger up to me and Bernie Sanders supporters at every single chance they get. So when you tell me to fall in line, that's not gonna happen. I already didn't feel as though they really represented me adequately, but really this election has been so illuminating because it just shows that even if you try to go against the grain and get actual representation from someone like Bernie Sanders, who's not beholden to corp corporate interests, well then, they hate you for it. They despise you for it. They try to smear you. Sorry, but I refuse to support a Democratic candidate who will perpetuate the American oligarchy and is itching to get into office so that way she can give more tax breaks to her friends who can start more wars, who can get more donations from the Clinton Foundation and then do favors for them. Not gonna happen, sorry. And I love how I'm supposed to be really excited about the first woman president, potentially. Uh, actually, I'm really excited to cast my vote for a woman who is qualified, who's capable, who has the policy positions who I agree with. Her name is Jill, though, not Hill. We, we worked hard on this. We dedicated our lives to this revolution, and to see it all fall apart, it's, it's not just frustrating, but... I can't even accept it because the process was inherently unfair. I mean, I could get over it. I could tow the party line. Well, maybe not that, but I could fall in line if the process just wasn't unfair. If there wasn't rampant election fraud, if there wasn't media bias, if the Democratic establishment wasn't so biased in favor of Hillary Clinton, I could actually maybe vote for Hillary Clinton, but not after the way that we were treated. Before anyone even casted a vote, I was told that Bernie Sanders could not win. It was impossible because the media was lying about the nature of superdelegates. People were led to believe that Bernie Sanders would have to win double the pledge delegates because Hillary Clinton has so many superdelegate endorsements when nobody in the media real mentioned that superdelegates don't vote until July and they usually support the candidate who has the most pledge delegates. So because of this, everyone felt disenfranchised. This suppressed turnout. This is what the media did. This is what we were dealing with. It's just been unfair. And furthermore, independents weren't allowed to vote in many primaries. That's not fair as well. And I'll also say that caucuses are not fair either, even though they do benefit Bernie Sanders. So overall, though, the unfairness was disproportionately felt by Bernie Sanders and his supporters. So under these circumstances, if we choose to fall in line, then everything we did, all the phone banking, all the donations we sent to Bernie Sanders, all of the hours that I've recorded talking about how Bernie Sanders is the superior candidate will be for nothing. The revolution will go away like that, poof. And I'm not ready to let that happen. So here's what we need to do as Bernie Sanders supporters. We have to make sure that the revolution will continue. And there are two ways that I think this can happen. First, we have to make sure that either we can remold the Democratic Party and make it in the image of Bernie Sanders. And if not, then we completely disband it in hopes that a new progressive party will emerge. Now we can facilitate that 
by participating in Dump the Dems Day on July 29th and switching your status to an independent. And furthermore, uh, we will continue to vote. I would encourage you, if you're burning your bust or if you're participating in Dump Dems Day, vote still because there are a lot of lower level progressives in house races and local races that we will need to get into office. Here's the second thing that we need to do, and I think this is the most important. Since we actually can't work within the Democratic Party or Congress to actually get real progressive change, we have to bypass Congress. We have to bypass the Democratic Party altogether. And the entirety of Bernie Sanders' movement has to coalesce behind the Wolf Pack initiative. So with Wolf Pack, we fight to get a constitutional amendment to get money out of politics. So what you do is you go to state legislatures and you have them codify the Wolf Pack amendment. And if 34 states or two thirds actually do sign on to this, then this will trigger a Article 5 convention, which means that we will be able to codify an amendment, getting money out of politics, actually mandating public financing of elections without Congress, and there's nothing they can do. Now, contrary to popular belief, this does not open up our Constitution for surgery, so you can't just get in and change everything. In fact, according to James Rogers, the scope of authority for the convention is defined by the topic specified in the 34 applications that trigger the convention. Any proposals beyond that scope would be out of order, and any single delegate could object to their consideration. Now, even if we just get halfway, if we get 15 to 20 states to sign on to the Wolfpack Amendment, well, this would basically force Congress to adopt that amendment as well, because they're afraid of delegating that control to the state. So they would just end up doing the amendment themselves. Now, there's precedent for this as well. So when it comes to uh, the ratification of the 17th, the 21st, the 22nd, the 25th amendments, all of these amendments basically came to fruition uh, due to threats of Article 5 conventions. Now, Wolfpack already has four states that actually agree to sign on to the Wolfpack Amendment. Now, Congress is aware of this. So, after Wolfpack got two states to sign on to this initiative, well, Congress decided to uh, come up with this law that would allow them to regulate money in politics. Now, it is complete bullshit and it wouldn't suffice because it just gives them the power to regulate money in politics if they want to. But if we go further and further, we're going to force them to listen to us. Now, the thing about Wolfpack is that nobody knows what it is. See, when I've spoken about this on college campuses, I ask students to raise their hands if they've heard of Wolfpack and zero has uh, heard anything about it. So if Bernie Sanders actually knows about Wolfpack and directs all of his followers to do this, this is how the revolution can live on. So if we can get someone like Jen Uger, who is close to Bernie Sanders, who actually uh, has the ear of the campaign, if we can get Bernie Sanders to know what Wolfpack is and to actually tell his uh, his supporters to put the weight of the revolution and their movement behind that, then we can actually have real political change in this country without going through Congress or the executive branch or the judicial branch. So that's what I believe should occur next. Uh, so we have to get behind Wolfpack. Uh, we also have to make sure that any progressive Democrats do get elected in office, but the revolution is not over. We have to make sure that we coalesce behind Wolfpack. Otherwise, this revolution could be the next Occupy, and we don't want that to happen. So we have to institutionalize. We have to throw our weight behind something, and it's just a matter of getting the word out there. So please spread the word about Wolfpack, because this is where the Bernie Sanders revolution will go next. Getting back to the issue of Bernie Sanders, uh, will he drop out? Not until the convention. And if he does, then I will be very disappointed. Uh, but I don't think he will. I think that he's principled. And I think that he knows it's really important that he remains in the way in the race. So that way he actually does have leverage. But in the end, uh, please don't be discouraged because this whole Democratic primary, it's really shown that we do have power. We can actually get a lot accomplished. We could take someone who is virtually unknown and make him into an international icon. Because yes, Bernie Sanders, he may be loved in the US, but you would be surprised how many international viewers I have tell me how much they love Bernie Sanders and how they're rooting for him in Denmark, in New Zealand. They love Bernie Sanders. So we did this, okay? This is more than Bernie Sanders. It's never just been about Bernie Sanders. It's been about real political change. And you guys should be incredibly proud of yourselves.